What a thrill to be on this uh, bar stool and to look around and see Joan Forsberg. <laughs> oh. And to see students, um, I, well, I started at Yale in, in Divinity School teaching in 1976. And uh, I can see the human image. I can see the Dante uh, Divine Comedy course. I can see um, t uh, Lively Word, well represented here. What a thrill. And talk about thrills. What a thrill to have Christian Wyman as a colleague. Um, I have been religion and literature here for all that time, um, apart from my eight year sabbatical at Boston University. Um, but to have at last a colleague like Christian is thrilling to me. Um, and I thought it, it's one thing to be an academic and to land here, my happy, happy story. But it's another thing to be a poet who's, yes, taught for a bit, but who um, he's now at a divinity school teaching a course called Faith and Poetry, uh, next semester, Accidental Theologians. What is a nice poet like you <laughs> doing in a school like this. <laughs> so I was telling some people at lunch that um, uh, it's quite, uh, it, it seems like pure chance that I should end up here and also pure grace. Um, I, uh, as Greg said, I've been editing a magazine for the last 10 years. I've been a writer for 30 years and, and uh, my direction has never been toward this. Um, I've found in my life that uh, I've been completely unable to predict the next course of my life and yet when something has opened up it's been very obvious what I should do and when this opened up uh, there's very few things in my life that seem so obvious I was just trying to make it happen, speed things along as much as I could. Um, for me it is a kind of natural culmination of my interests I've always wanted to talk about poetry in a way that was capacious enough to match my experience of it, my imagining of it. Uh, I find, have found in universities where I've been and I find traveling around talking to different groups that religion often has to be cordoned off from literary experience and even talking about poets that are very obviously poets of faith um, the element of faith is problematic. Uh, people become uncomfortable talking about it. We're going to talk about George Herbert and Helen Vindler once said that the, that I like Helen, she, but she once said that, that the religious aspect of Herbert wasn't important. That it was the formal elements, it was the, it was the fact that, that, that he was endlessly inventive uh, in poetry and that anyone could enter Herbert. That's true, anyone can, but if you set the religion aside, you've neutered him and and uh, so it's a great great thrill to me and a great honor to be able to work with these students who don't feel that rift between religion and literature do you feel, find that it's different when um, coming back from BU was there a noticeable difference well I was teaching in, in a religious studies department at BU so the biggest difference was in the quality of the classroom. I mean, I loved teaching the BU students, and I learned how to teach undergraduates there. Um, but I guess what, what one is capable of talking about here is, is wonderful, and the level uh, at which one can speak. Now, you mentioned George Herbert. Um, Love bade me welcome. Mm -hmm. The title of an essay, which I think of as, uh, as your signature essay, very confessional piece. George Herbert is one of the few books you have your students buy mm -hmm. for um, faith and poetry. Um, you've just referenced him, the first poet who's come into this room, aside from you. <laughs> why Herbert? And why that poem in particular? So George Herbert, for those of you who don't know, was a contemporary of Shakespeare, an Anglican priest. He didn't become a priest until late in his life and didn't get married until late in his life. He had these three years, he had a, he had a kind of tumultuous life 
in which he was trying to have political success and did in fact have political success, um, but was always very conflicted about it and felt called by God and felt uh, reproached for his own ambition. And so late in his life he becomes an uh, Anglican priest and he gets married, he has these three wonderful years. W. H. Auden thinks that most of his poems came from those years, there's no way of really knowing that. But he wrote poems that um, he didn't show to anybody, uh, except occasionally to one friend, mostly no, no one, and never tried to publish them, never really thought of himself as a poet in the world like that. After his death, he gave them to that one friend and, and said, if you think there's something here that will help other people, then publish it. If not, destroy it. And luckily, that friend published those poems, and so we have them. What I love about them is the clarity. There, there's just un, an unbelievable clarity that comes right through the centuries. And, uh, and I, of course, I respond to the mental tumult, because faith is not an easy thing for me. Uh, I respond to the mental tumult in, Her, in Herbert. Oh, Lord, let me not love thee if I love thee not. O oh Lord, let me not love thee if I love thee not. If I don't love you, then go away. Make this go away. Uh, and so it's, it's powerful that he was thinking of that 400 years ago. Let's read this poem, Love Bade Me Welcome. Those of you who know Simone Weil, the great 20th century philosopher and Christian thinker, um, she had a terrible time with headache, migraines, and just debilitating migraines. She died very early, very young. But, um, when she felt one coming on, she would recite this poem, Love, Love Baby, Love Three, it's called. Uh, and and it, for her, it both enabled her to experience God and it alleviated the pain, miraculously. Love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. Love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, ungrateful, ah, my dear, I cannot look on thee. Love took my hand and smiling did reply, Who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I have marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says Love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says Love, and taste my meat. So I did sit and eat. It's a poem about being approached by Christ and, and not feeling worthy. Uh, I often think that our, all of our questions these days are of the existence of God, and I often think that that's a sort of debased form of what Herbert used to feel, which was, why can't I feel close to God? He wasn't questioning the existence of God. We get stuck on that, and that's a rat's wheel. It just goes, to no, goes nowhere. Um, and, and, and you, how about, where were you, where, do you feel the same way about Herbert or other? I love Herbert. Yeah. Um, studied him in graduate school with Louis Martz. Oh, really? Um, yeah, uh -huh. Poetry of Meditation, Louis Martz, and taught him for the first time with Rowan Greer. We did a course on 17th century um, poetry and theology, um, and he is part of my lyric poetry class. I love that poem. I like that poem partly because I f I'd like to think that that's what it will be like to confront God face to face huh. at the end of life. Uh, it's, it's at the end of his collection, um, The Temple, and it follows uh, doom, heaven, hell, judgment, and then there's love three. And the notion of the soul coming to God and saying, uh, I am not worthy to receive you. Um, don't speak the word. 
and then having to be wooed and played with. I, I, love, the, I love the way the, the Lord, the love figure, is playful, yeah. seductive, coaxing. You know, come on, sit down. Yeah. So I did. And Hopkins has also been very oh, important. Oh, a fave, a complete fave. Yeah. Well, I think Hopkins was my first, aside from the Psalter, my first poetry. I mean, what I got in my indifferent undergraduate education, not undergraduate, my indifferent elementary education was um, I saw the dawn take off her dress with all her misty, lovely s. But Hopkins and the, the poem, this was in high school, not in grade school as that one was, Pied Beauty, which, um, I mean, you gotta look out the side of this window. Just look at those leaves and the brick and the clouds and the sky. Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles all on stipple upon trout that swim. I love that. Mm -hmm. Fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings, landscape. Plotted and pierced, fold, fallow, plow, and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter, original, spare, strange. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. He fathers forth whose beauty is past change. I just partly, I love the way it sounded. Fickle, freckled in those parentheses. Who knows how? Which basically is one response to the creation, right? Yeah. Why? Who knows how? It didn't have to be beautiful. You know. He has that, there's that great anecdote about Hopkins that when he was dying, he apparently said, um, I am so happy, I am so happy, I loved my life. It was very powerful, I think. Uh, Especially after the miserable life yeah. that he lived, <laughs> they lived yeah. in the end. I was asked to write an essay for a book called Ourselves, Our Souls and Bodies, which was a book from Cowley Publications about uh, being a Christian and being a sexual person. And I agreed to write this essay if I could write as me. I mean, not as a religion and literature professor or theologian or, or whatever. Um, and I, so I wrote about myself as a, as a gay person and a gay person who was a Christian. And it, I knew before I wrote it what the title was going to be. And I knew how it was going to end the poem. The title was going to be Counter Original Spare Strange. <laughs> <coughs> because there was, at that time of the Divinity School, this would have been in the mid-90s, uh, a ferment about uh, is homosexuality an optimal condition for the human person? Or, I mean, it just went on and on and on for a while. And um, I wanted this essay to be my Christian response. Well, a version of ACT UP's, I'm here, I'm queer, get used to it. How did, it, how did it play out? All what, things counter original <laughs> spare, strange. Well, I found out later, um, I think I had tenure. That's why I published that. <laughs> I, I think I felt free to be counter original spare and strange. But then I found out that uh, Letty Russell of Sainted Memory and uh, Margaret Farley had assigned my essay uh, in their sexual ethics course. So my students knew a great deal more about me than I was prepared to be. So. Do you do much autobiographical writing? Do you find yourself doing that now? Or I know you, you said at lunch you have to be provoked into these things. <laughs> do you? Uh, I think it's the vulnerability of middle age when you start thinking that you're allowed to speak autobiographically, and it can be too much, yeah. 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 Uh, as we all know. Um, but in fact, um, 
my sermons are inflected with my life. The hope is always that my life, your life, that somehow they're going to touch and that life will become real as a part of that. One of my great texts is Augustine's Confessions. Yeah, me too. Uh, And Rowan Greer and I did a course on that years ago. Um, Love it. And of course, course the, the text that has preoccupied me for how many years now, uh, in the middle of the journey of our life, I found myself in a dark wood. And it's scary to even think of recounting the experience I had. But in order to tell of the goodness that I found there, I'll tell my story. The, the Commedia is a 14,233-line, 100-canto autobiography. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I'm drawn to it. But the question, do I, sparingly? I think for me the issue is the writings that I respond to are those in which you can see the self has been burned off to some extent. Hmm. That is, it may use, the self may be used as a subject, but um, in, the, in the contemporary way that we think of self as self-esteem or bettering ourselves or uh, that, something about that, the way we present ourselves to other people, something about that has been burned off to get to greater truths, to get to other things. And uh, I get very bored with a kind of, uh, it's particularly American writing, that's all about the self. Um, I think we need, actually, I think it's a powerful way of expressing ourselves. I'm going to teach a class on spiritual autobiography. So the students will be writing, studying models and writing autobiographies. But my aim will be to, 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 to teach them to start with the self and then figure out how to burn it away, how to, how to uh, get to other things. Uh, a fellow here a few years ago was Lauren Winner, whose first book was Girl Meets God, and uh, whose most recent book, which he was working on when she was here, is called Still, a spiritual memoir. Um, you've written one, My Bright Abyss, right? Who will you include in that course? Uh, certainly Augustine, um, uh, probably Mary Carr, her first book, uh, Liar's Club. Uh, Gillian Rose is a British philosopher who wrote an absolutely beautiful little 150-page book when uh, she was dying. Uh, Sarah Grant, uh, a nun who was sent from England over to India, spent her life in India, became a Sanskrit scholar and wrote a book, again a tiny little book, about her life and how she felt the need to integrate her Christian faith with Hinduism. Beautiful book. Um, so, you know, I, I may do Camus' essays. I mean, Camus is obviously not, a, uh, we don't think of him as a religious writer. We think of him as an anti-religious writer, but that works. That works fine. Mm-hmm. You, can have a, you can have the theology of the void or negative theology and, and talk very well about people like Camus, and Camus is one of my favorite writers. So, and particularly uh, his, his late, he wrote a, it's a thinly disguised memoir. He called it fiction, but it's the first man. It's the last book he wrote, which is very obviously memoir. Mm-hmm. So that one we would, we would use. So where did you read all this stuff? I mean, uh, reading your um, essays, and I know that you were a book reviewer, um, but English major in college? I was. I, I was an economics major, actually, for the first two, what? two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> Christian, of all that I know, that's the one thing that doesn't you make predict, sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been very poor. I wanted to make some money. Uh, so then I became a poet. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I started out as an economics major and, I, and did the, almost did the degree. I, I didn't finish. But I switched to English, so English literature. Uh, but my education was not very good. I mean, it, my, I think of my education as the books I read on my own. In fact, after college, I moved to England and I set out to read all the books that I had read in my classes on my own, just because I thought I couldn't get it in the class. I couldn't, I couldn't engage it properly. It's just a fluke with the way I read or the way I take in things. And so I, I went very systematically and 
read through Milton and Wordsworth and all these things that I had studied in college, but then I wanted to possess it on my own. <laughs> he has a wonderful essay called Milton in Guatemala, where among the few or only books he brings in this language intensive deprivation experience yeah. <laughs> that you have uh, is Paradise Lost. And um, an unlikely work to bring to, yeah. to Guatemala. It's the only one I brought. It's the, the only, only book I had. I, I just had a very small bag. Um, and then as I was reading through, <laughs> through the essays, um, Milton keeps on cropping up. Um, you like moments in the poem a lot, but it's a style that puts you off. Sometimes. I love the style at times. Uh, I mean, I don't really have much original to say about Milton, but I, what I love is, I love the syntax stretching all over the place. I love the psychology. Mm -hmm. He's got the devils in the, um, in hell in the second book, and I'm, I'm just haunted by these phrases. Uh, by these lines, our torment. One guy, one devil is arguing, let's just stay here. We'll get used to it. It's hot. Look, it's hot, but we'll get used to it. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, don't, let's don't make things worse than they already are. And, uh, and he says, our torments also may in length of time become our elements, these piercing fires as soft as now severe, our temper changed into their temper, which needs must remove the sensible of pain. So we'll get used to this. We'll get used to our own misery if we just stay here. And uh, that's a, that's a um, state of mind that I'm intimately familiar with, that, that uh, a kind of adoration of absence or despair that uh, doesn't go anywhere. Without my loneliness, I would be more lonely, says Marianne Moore, so I keep it. It's, uh, surely you know what I'm talking about. But you gave it up. Yeah, I did. That was important to me. Uh, important. Milton was important to articulate both a state of mind, but also a, a, a way of being in the world, because he was so nasty to his daughters and, and uh, wife. Uh, wife, and yeah, he was, he was, you know, really, really reprehensible. Charles the first. <laughs> the late unpleasantness, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And so I was <laughs> fighting with that a lot in my 20s. How do you be a writer where it seems to take every bit of your emotional life and still have a life in the world? Uh, I, I just found that being a poet in particular took all of my emotional life. But we talked about this briefly. You love a different Milton, right? A, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I love the way he sounds when I read him out loud or when someone else reads him out loud. Yeah. I just find the, the, the sh I, I guess the extraordinary visuality of the poem, um, I find it remarkable. And it helps m my sense of the remarkableness of it, that he was blind yeah, it's amazing. when he wrote it. Yeah, that it's amazing. the sun on, on surfaces was something he could remember, but no longer see. Yeah. And then the fact that that vision was somehow translated into language, and that language would be spilled out onto the page that somebody else would write as he dictated it? These miserable daughters who were enslaved to him? Yeah. But, um, yeah. Well, let me ask story. you, yeah. you did, um, this follows from that, because it's something I'm very curious about. You did the Beecher Lectures, I know the Beecher Lectures are going on right now, and Peter did them several years ago, 2008 or something? 2007, yeah, 2007. the year before I came back. Um, and in that, in those lectures, Peter talked about imagining an afterlife. He published a book called Undiscovered Country, and uh, Shakespeare reference, and, and um, uh, talked about imagining an afterlife. And I wonder, do you find Milton, Dante helpful in that regard? Or how do they, how do they fit in with how you think of an afterlife? Um, my afterlife is into thy hands I commend my spirit. It's pretty fair. Yeah. Instead, I mean, it's, it's fervent, but it's um, the angels and archangels and all the company of heaven are part of the imaginary 
that I've learned through the Book of Common Prayer and through the scripture, um, through art, through the poet to whom I've been addicted for so long. You know, I mean, nobody thought about the afterlife as much as, as he. <laughs> in fact, I was um, on sabbatical in Stonington, uh, Connecticut, living in the home of the recently deceased James Merrill. And um, there was a knock at the door. Nobody knocked on my door in Stonington. I mean, that was one of the reasons I was there, to write a, <laughs> to write a book. And there was this lovely woman who, um, whose first question was, do you think about the afterlife? <laughs> she was Jehovah's Witness and oh, was big oh. in her theology. And I said, seven or eight hours a day? <laughs> 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 but it's, it's Dante's uh, afterlife, uh, I think about for seven or eight hours a day. On the other hand, who knows? I mean, I, I, um, the Beecher Lectures were an opportunity for me to, thank you David Kelsey, it was your fault to think about preaching and to think about what word I had to deliver. And although I preached somewhat, you know, somewhat, um, it was Dante that I had been spending my time on in a divinity school. So I thought, okay, the preacher's divine comedy. The preacher in hell, which is called Saturday. <laughs> yeah. The Preacher Sunday in morning. Purgatory, which is called Early Sunday Morning, and The Preacher in Paradise. Um, what's next, father or mother, reverend, pastor? What's next? Have to say something. In my father's house are many mansions. So I thought that since ministers in particular are faced with that question of thinking about what's next, or what else would be another way to put it, or what more. And since Dante wrote a whole poem about this, that I would put my big nose to that grindstone and see what I came up with. Yeah. And what I came up with, it's who knows, but to practice living now so that there is an afterlife to this and to imagine a being with God which is beyond anything I've experienced but of which I have hints, that seems worthwhile. Yeah. So, that, and, yeah. and what about you? Well, let me read this poem. It's, um I use it in the, we talked about it in my class. It's by a Polish poet named Anna Kamienska. And she converted to Christianity after the death of her husband when she was in her 30s. And um, she's not much translated here. There's a handful of poems translated. And when I was editor of poetry, we translated, I commissioned uh, three different big chunks of her diaries. She's more famous for her diaries. <laughs> They're not diaries like we may think of diaries where you write down what you did every day. They're, they're little incisive thoughts, just slicing thoughts, aphorisms, little bits of language. Um, this, is a, this is my favorite poem by her. It's called A Prayer That Will Be Answered. Lord, let me suffer much and then die. Let me walk through silence and leave nothing behind, not even fear. Make the world continue. Let the ocean kiss the sand just as before. Let the grass stay green so that the frogs can hide in it, so that someone can bury his face in it and sob out his love. Make the day rise brightly as if there were no more pain, and let my poem stand clear as a window pane bumped by a bumblebee's head. What I love by that is that she asks for everything to be exactly the same, for her death to change absolutely nothing. It's sort of the logical extension or fruition of Christ's prayer in the garden, not my will but thine. 
let reality go on. You don't, don't change reality for me. Let it go on. But then at the end, she's got to let my poem stand clear as a window pane against which a bumblebee bumps its head. And suddenly this poem is brought right up into the foreground and it's here in front of us. And in fact, she's succeeded. This poem is clear as a window pane and suddenly we're bumping our heads on it. And so that she's made herself present in an afterlife that seems to be completely devoid of change. It's, it's a complete mystery, this poem, a complete mystery, it, because it does two things at once. And that goes to the heart, maybe, of what you were saying about we're given these glimmers that we can't explain. Seamus Heaney said, glimmerings are what the soul's composed of. Glimmerings are what the soul's composed of. Great line. Given these glimmers, which do seem to promise some ultimate fruition, um, but if you look at it dead on, uh, it just goes away, it just, just vanishes. Bumblebee bumped. Yeah, that's a trend. That's fun. Yeah. So the end of the poem ha has a. That's true. Yeah. Has, has some, a lightness, a buoyancy. Yeah. 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 She's a wonderful writer if you want to look up online. The only place you can find her writings really is online, the, the prose writings, but you can find them on the Poetry Foundation website. There's three big sections of her diaries. Anna Kamienska. You know, I think this was, um, is in part a conversation between you and me, but it was also poetry in the round, yeah. and we're, we're meant to um, open it up. Open it up. How that happens, I'm not sure. Oh, we will have Are there to. elves have with point. microphones who go dashing around the room? He's got a microphone. So we're, Elf. We'll, we'll take some questions. And, and can I ask very quickly, would you identify yourself and then pose your question and let them know which to whom the question is addressed? They can both respond. Uh, Charles Harper, uh, class of 1961. Uh, this is a question for Christian. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, reading My Bright Abyss a couple of weeks ago and have been recommending it to my friends. <clears throat> and one of my friends, with whom I've had a wonderful conversation about your book, said she loved the book, but she was disappointed that you hadn't said anything in the book about how a modern Christian believer relates to other world religions. Huh. Would you want to talk a little bit about uh, how you relate your faith as a modern Christian believer to other world religions? Uh, not well. I mean, I, I, uh, I know smatterings of other religions, but Christianity is the religion that I know and the language that I know and the one that I feel stuck with and most blessed with as well. Um, I am very moved by a book like the one I mentioned by Sarah Grant where she integrates Hinduism and Christianity. But my own sense is that uh, I desperately need to understand my own tradition, Christianity, and, and uh, I just can't take on anymore. <laughs> yeah. uh, Bert Marshall, class of uh, 1997. Um, earlier this year, the American novelist, contemporary novelist, Michael Chabon, published a short piece in the New York Review of Books in which he took up the question, can contemporary song lyrics be thought of as poetry? Um, he concluded that they cannot. Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan, Beatles, he used a number of examples. I I'm wondering um, if you agree. Bob Dylan, not lyrics? Yeah. Not, not poetry. Poetry? You take away the music. Well, my friend and former colleague at BU, Christopher Ricks, one of whose first books was Milton's Grand Style yeah. from 1968. I love Bob Dylan. 500 page book, which never looks at the music, which in itself is weird, you know, um, on the language. So, I mean, and I'm, I'm convinced that the, these are poems. Yeah, and uh, I, it seems to me that we've had plenty of precedent. I mean, uh, uh, Campion, um, all these, you know, they used to play 
these in the Renaissance play poems accompanied with the lute. Or, Herbert. Yeah, Herbert as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I yeah I I agree. Uh, I I don't. It seems to me crazy to start trying to make those distinctions. This is not poetry. This is because as soon as you do that, something something will come out that defies all of your expectations and, and makes you look ridiculous. Hi, my name is Meredith Day, and I'm a current student graduating in 2015. Praise God. And I have a question for you, Chris. I was um, thinking about how you were talking about some, a little bit about your, your memoir, My Bright Abyss, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the writing process is different for you um, working on poems versus working on your memoir, mm -hmm. and if that is different. It is usually different, um, quite different, because with poems I'm so driven by the sound of the language, and so that tends to predominate and, and lead me into all kinds of mental crannies that I never could have gotten to otherwise, and emotional crannies and, and uh, expanses. Uh, with prose, it's quite different. Um, you're not wrestling with matters of form and, st and sound in the same way. And so it was a very different experience to write that book. However, that book was put together like, um, like plucking things out of a cyclone. I mean, there was no order to it at all, and I would just grab something and uh, have a thought, and, and then it would gradually take its place among the whole. And, and it would seem inevitable, but there would be a long process where it wasn't inevitable. So it was very like poetry in that regard, in, in the sense that I was deeply confused writing it. <laughs> in reading My Bright Abyss, there were things that just leaped out at me, like that wonderful phrase, the burn of being, mm -hmm. which is both noun and verb, and so startling an image. Can you talk about how you come up with those wonderful eliminations? It's funny. I heard someone ask Jim as he needed this the other night before he died, just a few months ago, and, and his answer was sheer bloody genius. <laughs> <laughs> it was very good. Um, I, I don't know, honestly. I don't know. I don't know where those sounds come from. Um, I was telling the people at lunch, I still am just absolutely baffled by where poetry comes from. I can't explain it, I can't predict it, I can't control it. It seems to me I, I have less understanding of it now than I did 20 years ago. I'm Angela Wiggins from the class of 11, and my question is, would you read some more to us or recite some poetry? I brought uh, a couple of poems of my own so this is about a preacher. That's the reason I brought it. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are preachers, and, and this guy want, was telling me that he had just come from uh, being with a woman who was dying, and her doctors kept trying to save her, and she finally just said, stop warring with my God. And, uh, and he couldn't get over that phrase. And he and I were having a discussion about how God comes to us or whether God comes to us, and that incident kept haunting him and then it began to haunt me and so I wrote this poem. So it begins with the woman and then it will move into this coffee shop where I'm sitting with my friend and, it's, it, and it begins to snow outside and it ends with uh, three verses from the Psalms. It's called Self-Portrait, Half Buried. Stop warring with my God, cried the dead woman to her doctors who believed that speech, pulse, and pain betrayed a life they were yet meant to save. So the lift ascends to a quick decline. So a room assumes one more degree of gone. Hmm. The love seat like solid smoke. The goodwill card table where she pasted Easter seals and savored preservatives. The weak tea of uptown dusk seeping onto the cot from which she's too tired to rise when the new preacher stops by, thumbing through psalms and sympathies. Stop warring with my God, I told them, she tells him, who, a hectic 
hour later stops to look out the window of the coffee shop where he has been grappling with nature and scripture, God's absolute otherness and electrons that seem to read researchers' minds, the crux at which to assert and to assent become the same abrading verb. She won't last the weekend, he says, who said to the woman whose sobs fell soft as the late unstaying snow that touching everywhere leaves everything even more bare. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. I shall be satisfied when I awake with seeing your likeness. Uh, Christian did an interview with that minister. Was that you, the, the person oh, in the yes, 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 yeah, yes. for the Christian Century? Yeah, and he, yeah. and in the spirit of the Beecher lectures, um, you walked into his church. You heard him preach. Then he later came after you in a house call or whatever, yeah. right? He wrote me and wrote me an email and followed up. And uh, I hadn't been in a church in twenty years. And. Uh, he and I just hit it off. And so we started talking, and it was a tiny little church in Chicago. There, was, there were only about 50 people in the, in, in the services. Uh, <laughs> but we hit it off and have become very close friends. Yeah. And I'm sort of amazed at his life, so I'm always asking him questions. I'm very curious about his life because of the things he experiences. It seems to me a, a minister's life is so close to the bone. I don't know, maybe it doesn't seem that way if you've done it for years and years, but from the outside, it just seems daily you have these engagements with people who are right on their last legs, last shreds of hope or faith, and, and you're wrestling with that with them. Uh, as I said at lunch, it, it seems to me a heroic thing. Is it anything he said in his sermon or in these conversations, or is it some presence in him, some... It was really just that we could talk about, you know, he was a reader and we could talk about books. And, mm -hmm. and so that's where we found an entryway. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was desperate for God and, and uh, just desperate. Everything I read was directed at that. Everything I thought about it 24 hours a day, I, I was desperate. And so I needed, uh, I needed him. And he stepped into that gap, as mm -hmm. I'm sure people have done here many times. I'm Bethany Carlson, and I'm an MDiv incoming class of 2016. And I just have a question for you, Professor Wyman. I was wondering how your understanding of who Christ is, the nature of Christ, has perhaps influenced the way that you um, understand how narrative time works through a poem. Huh. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. You know, that's complicated. I haven't thought about it directly. I'm going to go home and think about it. Um, <laughs> and Bethany's in my class, so I can tell you in class. Um, no, I, my understanding of, of Christ, uh, I, for me, the great miracle is the incarnation. And I grew up with focusing on the resurrection. And that's why I asked about, you know, what what does the afterlife mean to you? How do you, how do you think about it? Where I grew up, the resurrection was everything and the fact that you had a life beyond this one. And as I've gotten older, what the great miracle seems to me the incarnation, that God would become matter. And uh, uh, if I think about it in the terms of a poem, it's really interesting because um, I think about it as these flashes of insight that exists in great spans of time um, within a poem. Um, uh, for instance, this poem, not to make any great claims for it, but it, it includes a whole life, but uh, that life gets distilled down into these little moments. Um, the great Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel used to say that what faith meant was being faithful to the moments when you had faith. It's a discipline of memory and hope. 
And, and uh, so if I think about it in terms of a poem, you were given these moments of insight that then exist in great spans, expanses of time. And, and you try to be faithful to those moments. Uh, David Stinson of 75. I heard a, a classics translator uh, say to a group of students once, we all think that content is the all important thing, but the ancients thought form was as important as content. That was the way, it was the two things together that, that allowed them to communicate their poetry. Uh, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> Peter? <laughs> what is truth? <laughs> With, I, have, I have written what I have written. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> scripsy, scripsy. Uh, the other day, um, with my undergraduates, we were reading the Aeneid, and I asked them a particular passage, tell me about this passage. And they said what it was about. And I said, no, tell me about the passage. The passage is the way it's, it's written which goes to where, you're, where you go, but boy, the trip there and all the stuff that goes along with that trip that you, you haven't noticed yet because you were looking for what it meant. So, I mean, that's a form question. I can't divorce them, yeah. but one of the things that I think literature teachers do is concentrate on the form because most people don't. Yeah, I agree completely. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Oh, thanks.